Good morning to you and welcome to New Day Saturday edition. It is the 10th day of February 2018, the day after news broke of the tragic death of a burden talent, a vivacious and bubbly soul. Um, and the nation has since been thrown into a state of shock and despair. I'm talking about Ebony Rains, who lost her life in a tragic car crash on um, Friday morning. And we are indeed as a nation mourning her, along with two other persons who were traveling with her. And we say this morning we're joining the many um, people or Ghanaians that are sending their condolences to the bereaved families. Indeed, we pray that the good Lord finds a place in his bosom to grant them peaceful rest. As usual, we're coming to you from the studios of TV3 here in Accra. We are also live on 3FM 92.7 and we're streaming live online around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. We will be with you from now till 9.50, but in between then we'll have some interesting conversations um, in respect of some topics I'll be outlining very soon. We do encourage you to send through your messages, your contributions, remarks, questions, if any, to our WhatsApp number 050-0607070. And we will be happy to share them with the rest of the world. <coughs> so this morning, we are looking at uh, four topics. We'll start off with the President's Second State of the Nation Address. On Thursday this week, the president delivered his second State of the Nation address since taking office in January 2017. Now, the major difference between this address and the one that he um, gave on assumption of office was the fact that with this one, he was reporting on the State of the Nation after one year under his stewardship, whereas in 2017, it was the state of the nation as of the time the NDC government handed over reins to this government. And so this morning, the panel shall be scrutinizing the state of the nation address as reported by the president with particular focus on some sectors, including the economy, education, unemployment, agriculture, to mention a few. Also up for discussion this morning will be the COPEC ICU demonstration over increasing fuel prices. Now the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, that's COPEC, in collaboration with the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, embarked on a demonstration on Wednesday over what they describe as persistent increases in prices of petroleum products. Now they contend that the dynamics which prevailed at the time some taxes and levies were imposed in order to mark up government's revenue from oil exports are no longer prevailing. That being the case, they contend that those taxes imposed should be reconsidered within the context of the price build-up of petroleum products. Question is, can government afford to review the price build up of petroleum products to either scrap or reduce these taxes? We shall be looking at this in the course of the show. Also, the president is slated or scheduled to um, engage in some performance appraisals of his appointees on Monday. Now this comes on the back of an evaluation report on government appointees submitted by the Minister for Monitoring and Evaluation, Dr. Akuto Osei. Now what are we to expect from this exercise? It's only a matter of time to find out about exactly what that exercise will yield. The panel will be looking at the possible outcomes of the exercise even as we wait for the exercise to actually happen. Last but not least, we'll be looking at the Exton Cubic Group case and the decision of the court. What does this mean in the light of operations of the company in the mining sector? Now, the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, per letter dated 4th September 2017, wrote to Exton Cubic to inform the company that three mining leases that were granted to them in 2016 by the then government were null and void as the company failed to comply with statutory obligations. Now, the company, obviously not happy with this decision by the minister, um, went to court to seek redress. Now, the court this week 
gave its ruling on the matter and held that the minister's letter purporting to cancel the lease um, was issued in excess of his jurisdiction. In other words, the minister didn't have the power to cancel the mining leases of Exton Cubic in the circumstances of the case. What does this mean for Exton Cubic and the government of Ghana? The panel shall be weighing in on this. At this point, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, I will introduce to you today's panelists for the conversation. You're watching New Day, Saturday edition. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to New Day, Saturday edition. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and we're streaming live online around the world at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. I'll quickly introduce the panelists for today's conversation and we'll get straight into business. From my far left, we have Mr. Obi Amwa. He is the Honorable Member of Parliament for Equipim South Constituency. He also is the Deputy Minister of Local Government and Rural Development. Next is Professor Kletus Dodonu. He is a Public Policy Analyst and the Chairman and Executive Director of Claydot Consult. Next, we have Mr. Yao Pong, a private legal practitioner and a law lecturer at the Central University. And lastly, we have Mr. Sam George. He is the Honorable Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram constituency. Good morning to you and mm -hmm. welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you here and um, we'll be going straight into matters lined up for conversation. But we can't, of course, go on without, you know, um, some <coughs> tribute of sorts to um, one of Ghana's budding talents who um, <coughs> uh, tragically, uh, you know, was caught up in a fatal car crash, Ebony Rains we're talking about. So a quick, you know, round around the table, your thoughts and any lessons or advice to be churned out. And I will start with you, um, well, thank Mr. Obi um, Good morning to viewers and your listeners on radio and to my colleagues on the panel. Um, yes, it's a tragedy that we should lose such a bad in talent, as you put it. Um, a lot of us were really in shock when we heard yesterday in the morning, somewhere around dawn, that the lady had passed away with two other persons mm -hmm. on the vehicle, and that the driver was um, unconscious, more or less, at Bichim Hospital. And what came to mind, of course, was the fact that here was somebody who, who within the past two years, had risen to almost the top, and was probably expecting to be sweep the awards, mm. the upcoming awards night for um, the GMAs, yeah. And all of a sudden, we hear she's no more. Subsequently, if you if you had the opportunity to watch a video with her mother and other relatives in Brahafu, you you're even tempted to think that the clothes that she wore mm. were the same clothes that we were later on, uh, or the same thing that we saw when the accident happened. And it's so tragic. And sometimes you think that probably for such talents, it should be seen as national assets. And maybe we should find a way of protecting them or ensuring that at least all things are done to keep them so that the nation will benefit. Mm. It's, it's so sad. And for parents, I wonder how they're going to cope with this. I'm a parent. Yeah. My kids are around her age. And for her to just pass away. It's, it's so sad. Yes, I, indeed, I, I, indeed. I, I can't it. just believe that this has happened. And it's, it's becoming sometimes too many mm. for it, young talents. We, we mm. saw Terry Bonjaka mm -hmm. and then Susie Williams mm. and now this lady. It appears we probably we don't take too much effort ensuring that maybe they stay on. Mm. And some have brought in the fact of uh, road accidents. I am particularly scary about traveling the night. I always try to avoid, avoid. traveling the night because of various circumstances. Mm. 
And I remember very well losing a very good friend, Ferdinand Im, who was going to go for paragliding, mm -hmm. and he lost his life in that same mm -hmm. way. I remember earlier to a new president had also lost his life when he was traveling in the night. Our roads are not too safe in the night, and um, it's a bit risky if we take things for granted mm. when we decide to travel very deep in the night. Of course, some do have said that some of our roads do have their own problems. But I mean, you can't, you can't control people's decision yes. to travel in the night, but yes. it's, for, it it's for the authorities to provide all that is needed to make and the roads and safe. It, and it's isn't for it? also drivers to be more exactly. careful and cautious. Yeah. You cannot take things for granted. Sometimes you think that you even have the energy to travel in the night. But if you were to sleep <laughs> on the way, mm. and mm. anything could happen. Right. So several factors come into play, mm. but it's just a tragedy. Then mm. there's this aspect of even the military man on board. That, that's yeah. true, but Prof, I, quickly we need to go around, so I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, Honorable, so I would, you know, I yes. know the issues are many yeah. and all, but yes. we have some other matters that yes. we've lined up for yes. discussion. We'll need to get straight on to that as well. So quickly let me go to mm. um, Prof for your thoughts on this quickly, and then I have the other two ha give their perspectives on this rather tragic um, situation. Well, all that I can say is that whatever that happens, let's give glory to God. Let's thank God for her life. Just about three months ago, I buried my daughter at 48 years. Okay. Sorry. So the feeling is uh, <coughs> controlled to some extent because of the statement. In all circumstances, give glory to God. That's all that I very can well. say. Very that, well. That, that's indeed um, uh, very profound there. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Pong. Yeah, this uh, road exactly. Mm. I, mean, I never met her, but everybody knows I really enjoyed <laughs> her music. The music yeah. And I have a friend, the lawyer also, he says every Friday he will play as many of her songs <laughs> in the morning as possible. And he could sing almost all the lyrics. Wow. And, and he was the one that really introduced me okay. to this lady's uh, wonderful, entertaining music. Uh, it's, it's a shame that we had to lose her uh, at about age 20. 20. And uh, I think that sometimes that you may tend to agree with those who say that perhaps we were all created for a specific purpose within a specific time. And when that is up, you can do nothing about it. You okay. have to go. Maybe that's the best encouraging or inspiring uh, message that we can give to the parent. Otherwise, th there's no, in my view, other explanation mm. for it. Um, we, nobody may, may have been able to avoid it. Road accident, I mean, I used the Kumasi Road on Sunday, and there are parts of the road that when you get there, you just have your, your heart in your mouth, as if you are just not very sure whether you get to your destination. Mm. And so, but when you get to the dual carriage area, the Nkoko bypass, there's a, a bit of a sense of safety, mm. as it were, as you drive, because you know that even when there is a problem, you'll be able, you have two ways, and no oncoming vehicle. So moving on, I think we should also try this, especially this long road from Kumasi to at least Sunyani to the north. Mm. And so we should try as much as possible. If every year we construct a few other kilometers, kilometers. and so try and move, move most of them from the city centers. Mm. I mean, we, that road used to go through Kibi and um, Chebi. Now it's no more in Koko. <coughs> so the Konongo and all these other places, we should try and get bypasses <coughs> and make sure we get this dual carriage. Maybe in the fiscal sense, but otherwise, in my view, I, I am tempted to agree that she has done her best. Within two years, she had even got a, a, a former president, the current president, politicians, to acknowledge her. I mean, most people couldn't have achieved that yeah. in, a year, in, in their whole lifetime of 60 years or so. So it means she has done her best. A short but illustrious life. Yes, she has done her best, there. and I think that we should, as um, Prof said, let's give thanks to God. It's very difficult to say mm -hmm. that now, but at the end of the day, what matters for me more is where the, her soul will be mm -hmm. reposed. Mm -hmm. It's in the bosom of the Almighty mm -hmm. God. If 
God to have mercy on her. Um, at, her at her age, she may not have been able to be exposed to matters that will make her look at things in terms of other perspectives. So whatever evil, um, maybe ills or sins or bad deeds that he, she may have found herself into, either voluntarily or otherwise, God should forgive her. Right and just save her Grant so her peaceful rest so okay. we meet again that's that's yeah. true yes honorable son george your take on this well let me say a very good morning to our viewers and listeners and to your very good self and my co-panelist mm -hmm. the loss of any one Ghanaian life by virtue of any uh instance of commission or mission is regrettable right more so when it is somebody who is in the public space like the young Ebony Reigns or Presla, as she was properly so-called, um, happens. My thoughts and prayers, and that of the entire minority in the NDC, is with her family. Um, her mother, who she had just spent some of her last living hours mm -hmm. with. I mean, that video yeah. that came out post the announcement is, is telling of the kind of bond that existed between she and her mother. We've seen subsequent videos of her mother in anguish. We can, we can only ask for the repose of her soul and ask God to grant them the fortitude to bear the loss. Right. We cannot discount the role of the state of our roads in, in, this, in this unfortunate incident. I mean, yes, you may not want to travel in the night and all of that, but there are times when you cannot, you, ex you, can, you can't help it. Mm. You just have to. I mean, um, and, and at times it's not even just the long distance roads uh, cancel. At mm. times, even just our regular roads in the mm. city. Mm. Take, for example, I, I use the motorway almost every day, and I'm, I'm sure uh, cancel also does mm. when you go into the constituency, when I go to Ningo Pram Prab, and you see the number of accidents on that road that are occasion because there's poor lightning on our roads. If you take our light bills, we all pay street lightning as part of our light bills, yet you, are, you wonder what happens to the lights on our major roads and in the state of our roads. We are being told that this accident was caused by a heap of sand. Of sand. Um, several people have tried to ask questions and do permutations as to if the road was being constructed, whether that heap would be there and all of that. Those are all post-factor rationalizations that we are getting ourselves mm. involved in. But all we want to say is that, like Honorable Obiama said, we've seen Susie Williams go like this, we've seen Terry Bonchaka go like this, now is Ebony. Are we going to continue to lose our, our, our great entertainment uh, icons in their prime? because of avoidable this is an avoidable Not act any. it's very avoidable and and we can only we can only share in the pain and anguish of the family may right. her soul rest in peace right well said and thanks for those um glowing tributes there but we'll get on to the business of today which is we'll start off with the state of the nation address the president was in parliament um to give his second state of the nation address since his taking over the reins of government in january 2017. um even before we go into the specific sectors of the economy, education, employment or unemployment and other areas, I just want us to look at something that the president said or an observation. You know, in the, he commended parliament for, you know, parliament's role in his government so far. He talked about the fact that um, parliament assisted him in putting together his excellent team in constituting the government in record time. And then he talked about how busy the, this parliament has been in respect or a, a, in comparison to other parliaments in the Fourth Republic. Apparently, you know, um, this parliament has had 140 days of sittings in its first session, whereas, in, you know, the others have not had more than 130. And then also he talked about the fact that the, this parliament has... Um, been able to pass um, a number of his flagship programs, uh, you know, within a certain space of time. And that was quite, for me, I thought that was quite commendable because of consistently we, Parliament is bashed for one thing or the other. But to hear this, and indeed these are facts, factual things that he put out there. What, what would you say this, the, what does this do, you know, for our, you know, democracy? the kinds of things the president said about um, 
this, the, the, the seventh parliament. And perhaps I would want um, Mr. Sam George to start us with that one. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that you seem surprised that. by yeah, it. <laughs> you, you are looking in the direction of my senior <laughs> novel, Obi Amwa. No, I want uh, you to start. Anyway, um, the words of the president were true when it came to the number of sitting days that the seventh parliament has been involved in. I mean, about 140 days. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, it's expected. This parliament has been saddled with uh, an enviable responsibility of having to vet and debate the appointment of the largest government in the history of our republic. You know, our 60 plus years of being, or 60 odd years of being a republic. And so when you have to do the vetting of 110 ministers, um, I remember it was our first sitting, the first sitting of the first session. Mm -hmm. It was extended by almost two weeks, you know, um, to be able to allow us finish the, the vetting process and, and finish the approval processes of the ministers of state that are president. I mean, 110, when you had previously, I think the highest of about 82, there about. So clearly when you have to vet additional 30 ministers, <laughs> it takes some additional... So you, uh, you're saying that the, the, the extra time in sitting is as a result of the vetting... If, if you look at our calendar, doing, if okay. you look at our calendar, we're supposed to spend about 130 days. Mm. The additional 10 days mm. came from the additional two mm. weeks that we had to extend sitting to approve for the approval of the ministers. Mm. I mean, but it goes to, to, to the credit of both the majority and the exactly. minority in the House that we've been able to build a certain level of synergy when it comes to issues of national development to get things going. And, and, and this is a double-edged sword for government because when you challenge government on some of its failed promises in the first one year, they blame parliament for it and say that, or because parliament has not done what it ought to do. But this is a clear uh, proof that if that executive did what he had to do and brought it to parliament. Parliament was always and is ever ready mm. to get what we have to do. One, one clear case, for example, is the national identi identity card, what we call the Ghana card. The fact that when that debate in parliament came up, that, look, the government had failed in the promise that they had made in his manifesto, the response from some government uh, spokespersons was the fact that the bill is before parliament and parliament has not completed the bill. I mean, it doesn't take parliament to initiate a bill. It's the executive that has to bring that but bill. But once it's before you, once then it's, it's for us, for But we also, have, we, also, we also have a certain number of days. It has to spend a certain number of days before maturity. So if as an executive you fail to bring it on time, we will not be able to bypass our standing orders to get things done for you. And so, I mean, yes, it's to our collective credit that mm. we've been able to get things going. Uh, I believe that even though at times Honorable Obiamwa and his colleagues are pretty boisterous on the floor <laughs> of the house and who want to heckle as many times <laughs> and have their way, we, we have been committed to ensuring that the interest as of the is state... the minority side. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, we, we've been committed to ensuring that whatever the case is, we, we try to get the business mm. of the state going as quickly mm. as possible. Very well. I will Now, let's move to um, the economy. I know, um, Honorable obi you would want to touch yeah, on yeah. the parliament thing, obviously, because you're in parliament yourself. But <coughs> yes, we'll look at um, the economy and what the president had to say about it. You know, he gave an evaluation... Um, a positive evaluation of the economy. I mean, if you look at what he said, he talked about um, reducing significantly the budget deficits, um, you know, some prudent measures being put in place by the economic management team. And he indeed referred to some statistics that he had pushed, I mean, I mean put out there as boring, quote unquote, statistics. But whether they're boring or not, they are for a certain purpose and they seem to be showing a certain positive. Um, you know, direction. We do have the precedents here and we we'll, would want to take a listen to that and come to the panel for their insights in respect of this. So let's take a listen. Being able to meet my promise made last year to the House and reduce the fiscal deficit from 9.3% to an estimated 5.6% of GDP. The president also added in his address that his government had been able to reduce the fiscal deficit from 9.3% when they took over to 5.6%. We have increased our international reserves, maintained relative exchange rate stability, reduced the debt to GDP ratio and the rate of debt accumulation. We have paid almost half of arrears inherited. 
The reduction of the debt to GDP ratio, he said, is a strong indicator that the macroeconomy is being well managed. So according to the president, the macroeconomic is being well managed and he says that the indicators look good and it's worth celebrating as it were. But Prof, this is to you. A cross-section of Ghanaians, you know, think that the impact of these so-called positive indicators is yet to be felt because, you know, talk about cost of living, it continues to rise. Mm -hmm. And we recently saw the OPEC um, or COPEC ICU demonstration over rising fuel prices and all of that. We'll be getting into mm -hmm. that in a short while though, but clearly the cross-section of Ghanaians think there's a disconnect. Well, we are hearing of these, you know, glowing positive indicators, but we are yet to feel it. What do you say? Well, you know, this whole idea about the cross session of a country mm. feeling this way or that way has different uh, dimensions to it. Basically, when you are turning around an economy initially, it is not going to be the case that it will go through the pocket, the businesses, and the total economy immediately. It takes some time for this, and I have been saying this for a very long time now, that when you have a new regime putting things in place, these indicators are sign of direction. They are not what is happening immediately. Let's see interest rate, for example. Interest rates are going down, trending down. But some commitments were already made by banks. Some companies have contracted loans at certain rates. Some investments were done at specific projected rate of return. They are locked in. So generally, you see things going up more smoothly than coming down. Prices and other things, including the interest rate itself, is rigid downwards. So when indeed it's coming down, it's just a trend. It will take some time. And besides, something is happening in Ghana now, which we must all gear up and move it. It is the mind of people that government should do everything. Government, government, government. But it is not true. The government says it will do everything. It comes in with promises. No, government does public policy. Okay. The business of government. And the reason why we have parliament, I wanted to contribute, but... It was a short... <laughs> no, uh, you, can, you can contribute. It's just we are managing time. Parliament so. is the voice of the people. Mm. We can get all of them to come and speak at the place. So they have constituencies and then they have reps. So purely, if you go into serious jurisprudence and then you look at the various uh, crises that we have, democracy, though expensive, is one of the best. Mm. It's one of the best. However, when it comes to a situation where parliament can gear up the way they did, I think something wonderful is going to happen in Ghana. So what I want to say is that this feeling that government should provide this, that, that, we should now move into the paradigm where the private sector, no matter what it takes, we must create a good environment for them to be able to help. So these beautiful trends we are seeing can eventually have the desired impact. Normally when you do a policy and then you, you say this has happened, that is the incidence or the policy effect. It takes at times more than 30 years, 20 years, 10 years for the impact. Impact is a long-term effect, trending to the point of what happens to the people. Maybe the output will come a little earlier, maybe another two, three mm. years, then people will begin to feel that. 
those things that are coming, the jobs that are going or being uh, created now, the living standards of the majority. A few may be having higher standards of mm. living, but it will take some time for the majority. So this whole idea about cross-section, I think we have to do it more uh, scientifically mm. so that it represents uh, an, an unbiased uh, sample of the society. So That's you think that, that this cross-section we are referring to is quite biased? I, I, I can't know the basis mm. because some people, they are very vocal. And in a democratic dispensation, some people can have their own personal uh, no, uh, bias. Mm. That is, they like this or they don't like this. So no matter what it is, it's just like husband and wife. If a problem comes uh, to the family and then you are trying to solve the problem, some people will be, third party will be coming in. You know, some people, if they don't like that family, the, 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 the things they will say or the suggestions mm. or, or they will make, or some are very provocative, mm. but some are humbling enough to, to solve the problem. Mm. So this a very big mm -hmm. society we have, the size of a society is not determined only by the number of population mm. or the people on the ground. It's also determined by the interconnections to the global world. So let's, personally, I would say that let's be more scientific. Very well. Yeah. Very well. I'll move to Honorable mm. Obi Amwa here. Still on the economy and, and, and picking up from where Prof or some issues Prof raised in here, which has to do with the fact that, yes, these indicators, you know, over a period of time would show a certain trend and all. I mean, I've heard the minority say that, well, you may be talking about <coughs> these positive indicators, but it's as a result of certain policies they put in place or implemented, which is why we're seeing these things. Your, your, your reaction to that in respect of what Prof has said, which lends credence somewhat to what the minority is saying. Well, thank you so much. Um, first, I'll start by saying that um, I was really impressed with the president. The address was very well written. And as usual, vintage President Kufuado, <laughs> he read it very well. And he touched on almost all the issues that were required. And indeed, directly to your issue about whether figures really mean anything, mm. I want to quote the president. He says, Mr. Speaker, I do not suggest in any way that these headline-grabbing figures mean we are anywhere near resolving our economic problems. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, to borrow the language of the economists, that for the first time in a long while, our macroeconomic fundamentals are solid and all the critical indices are pointing in the right direction. He's not saying that because he's bringing out these figures, we've solved all our problems. But there are remarkable things that he has to mention. Mm. If interest rate is going down, he has to say it. And um, from 3.6% of our growth, if we are now at 7.9%, mm. he has to mention it. And if you look at all the indicators, that's why he's even bold enough to say that whatever it takes, we should be able to end the IMF supported external yeah. credit facility um, this year. So, you, the usual phrase and balance is, is it figures we will eat? <laughs> no, figures, figures we will drop. <laughs> 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 but it's figures which will help you <coughs> to know that you are on the right path mm. or you are not on the right path. For instance, if in the industrial sector, the growth rate has risen from 0.5 percent mm. in 2016 to 17.7 percent in 2017. It's remarkable. And if we be my my prayer every day is that some of these things should be sustained. And once we're able to be consistent and we're able to sustain some of these um, major achievements, that means we are on the right path. Mm. We the tendency is for us to be able to maybe start very well and then be complacent or, or go back and then the whole thing will have to start again. After all, we were told in 2016 by President Mahama in the State of Nation address that he was hoping that the deficit would be 5.3% uh, at the end of the year. Eventually, he ended up almost 10%. And 
and that threw everything way back. So I believe that even though for the average person, you will say that the figures should translate into jobs, it should translate, it should translate into more money in their pockets, uh, prosperity, uh, uh, cheaper goods on the market. I think that it's something that we need to build on, some, mm. especially when you're coming from where you're coming from, mm. the hole that we had to um, get into. If you're coming out, it's not just an overnight thing. And the president really painted the picture very well. The, the other issue is the fact that because the budget had been read, there are a lot of things that he even had to leave out because they are already in the budget. Mm. Otherwise, you would be repeating yourself as to how far we've been able to go mm. as far as the economy is concerned. And it's not only about the interest rate and the inflation and the budget deficit. It's also about the fact that we've been able to make some savings. And based on savings, we're able to take on bold initiatives like free senior high education. Mm. If you look, in, look at even the aspects about Auditor General, how he's managed to uh, really check what uh, others claim to be the liabilities of government. And if you look at even the procurement side, how we have managed to use the public procurement to cut down on uh, procurement practices, everything so sourcing, everything, um, uh, uh, the other aspect of it. It means that indeed, if you're talking about economy, it's not only really about these figures, but the fact that we'll be making a lot of savings for the average Ghanaian, and these savings can be put into other aspects mm. of the productive uh, sector, productive sector yeah. which would also uh, make Ghana grow, mm. and which w everybody will benefit. Free education doesn't know about Obiamwa's children and some girls' children. <laughs> they, well, no matter how they talk, <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of them young ones, <laughs> uh, if they don't benefit now, they will benefit in future when it comes to free education. So if you're talking about the economy specifically, I think a lot has been done, even though, as the president said, there's so a lot to More do. More to be done. Yes. Right, very well. Now, um, um, uh, Mr. Pong, quickly, um, Honorable, when speaking, touched on the issue about sustainability, how we sustain the gains we are making so that we don't erode all those gains we've made. But for me, I think it is true <coughs> that the test of our commitment to ensuring fiscal discipline comes during election years. And that is where we risk going back, eroding all the gains we made. And so, yes, we may be talking about these things. It looks good. But then the real test is the election year. And in this case, you're looking at 2020 and how we're going to fare to be able to s consolidate on the gains we've made or roll back. Isn't that the case? Yes, that, I mean, uh, wh when he was talking, uh, something came to mind. Mm. You know, we were once described as the, the fastest growing economy mm. with an excess of 14% mm. GDP mm. and so on. In 2011. Mm. Yes, but you see, it's also because sometimes uh, we, we, we are made to be confused by terms growth and development. They are not the same. I mean, and the explanation that was given around that time was mainly also because the oil, the extraction of oil or petroleum had just commenced and a lot of inflows, investments were being brought from uh, other parts of the country. So it wasn't so much about our performance internally. Mm. Of course, the attraction is part of it. But you see that since then, we started, the economy started shrinking, and we even got to up to 3.4. This time we are saying that the IMF have also predicted that our economy may be the fastest growing with 8 point something mm -hmm. percent. I hope that this time around we are going to sustain it as if we are able to achieve it. Because other countries can just manage 4.5 and so on, and they are still doing better in terms of development. So I think we, we shouldn't also too much highlight the growth aspect, which doesn't reflect only our performance, internal performance, but the performance of others who may not even live in, the, in this country. And if we look at it in that sense, then we must also factor into it the, the recent um, factors that the IMF and the World Bank, yeah. that is the Human Development, development Index. Index. Right. 
very important. And that is where then it will not be just about figures. It will be a, a reflection of the performance in the lives of the people. And if we ignore that, then the figures will not be meaningful. And that is the reason why these other perspectives and poly, uh, are being developed that don't only highlight figures, but the extent to which the figures have uh, impacted. impacted positively in the lives of the people should also be part of the determin determinants of the growth or the development of the economy. So indicators of a of a organized um, sorry of of a com of a, <laughs> well, country, say a yeah. company yes, of a country <laughs> doing well yeah. should go beyond these macro economic yeah. indicators to look at the human development Important, side of it. Because for me, if we are able to develop in ten, uh, our youth not just the formal education, but also in terms of skills, then we will be able to diversify <coughs> the economy itself mm. and the activities in the country to the extent that people, uh, I mean, Prof made the point, people will then not see the, the government, whatever, it, of course, well, in terms of law, mm. it's the president mm. or the managers of the economy. But they've been able to diversify the, the areas that they can also contribute to the extent that they will not be dependent mm. on the government or overly expectant of any freebies from the government. And, uh, and so the education of all of us, and in terms of education, not just even children or the youth, even adult education, the constitution provides for it that we should try that as much as possible. That should also be free, even university education. Because with that, then people will be independent and will not just be expectant of what, what, um, what the state can out. do for them. And I think we are also, sometimes when it comes to jobs, we some, well, I sometimes think that we lose sight of some, some. Now technology is replacing a lot of the things that humans mm. were doing. So our focus on even determining what is a job we should shift it from the 10 years or 20 years ago where we expect that 10 people will be doing some job. Now one um, computer, not even in the country, can do the same job. And, and that is why maybe policies like planting for food and, and, and so on, we should just encourage people to see agriculture. I was surprised that people were saying that because that policy uh, people who are just spraying the cocoa and so on with the government says it's part of job creation. And people are saying it is not. If it's not, what else then is job creation? Are they looking at the sustainability of it? Because obviously, if you're spraying, you will not be spraying the whole year round. You but spray but for a certain time or a certain season. Mm. And then what happens when you're not spraying? You see, you'll be surprised um, if you go to the rural areas um, and other parts, not really in the cities. The enthusiasm with which people have grasped this, because for them, what they want is the expectation that at the end of the month, mm -hmm. or maybe a couple of weeks, he's going to receive some salary or wages or income. <coughs> and even some of them, you'll be amazed, the, the clothing that have been provided them and the other facilities the fact that they are now able to use these machines, they train them on the job. Mm. So even where the government policy fails, these people still become relevant as private persons engage in such uh, provision of such se services. And so we should look once again, and it shouldn't be if I'm not in the police, if I'm not working for immigration, or I'm not a lawyer, then I don't have a job and I cannot imagine ever having a job. Mm. And I think that is a problem because elsewhere, people are now shifting their attention from government jobs and what they call the so-called blue or white color jobs and are now in a cr creative way. And it doesn't have to be physical. Research itself is earning people a lot of money, research, in terms of technology. So you can just, one person can create reset of course others are also existing because these uh, facilities are taking over their jobs but it is important that as the world moves on in terms of technology we also refashion out 
different ways of creating jobs mm. and, and, and also the curricula in school, should it just be about just you go, you read, and then you come out and you are unable on your own to create some innovation to ensure that job is created. Quickly, so, I, mean, I, I, mean, mm. I find your point about the, you know, the use of is it artificial intelligence to, you know, um, mm. as part of our um, employment sector or w mm. what have you, interesting. Because in those jurisdictions where these things have been employed, there's a complaint or there's a concern about you know, people not having jobs to do because now it's being shifted to computers. And here we already have a very dire situation on our mm -hmm. hands where you have so many people already unemployed. Yes, the, you know, resort to compute, um, the mm -hmm. ICT mm -hmm. would be good, but then already you have a chunk of people who are out of jobs. So how do you deal with that? But, but you see, out of jobs... Quickly, and then I go yeah, to but, my, but, Mr. But, but I'm saying that it's also because of the conception we have about job. Mm. When we say out of job, what are we talking about? I mean, um, what people don't want to hear is they should go into farming. But elsewhere, farming is a big business. Because the people, environment is conducive that is for exactly that. But we don't what have I'm it saying. as it is. So right. if people are not having jobs... It's not because one they are lazy, but it's because of the um, the, 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 the the perception and the the if you don't to call it the mentality mm -hmm. we have had about jobs. I mean, when and 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 the way the people who are supposed to go into such other jobs now, even I know of judges or lawyers who are into farming mm -hmm. as well, but those who are to, we, for whom it should be made mm -hmm. attractive, we haven't done that especially in terms of the kind of education. We used to even laugh at people who were doing a Greek in school. Mm. You understand? Because uh, years ago, when you, you, you were found in school to have um, engaged in some more practice or so on, we we'll give you a catalyst to go and read. <laughs> mm. You understand? So I'm saying that technology can even aid farming mm. as well. In fact, it does aid farming. Sure. So. Yes, those We've people... We've been striving to get to mechanized farming for the longest time, and I, I we're know. still doing... So, let us also, in a way, make some of these jobs attractive. I mean, I, most people who were in the university and, mm. and had, were compelled to travel during vacation, you, we all know the kind of jobs that we do there, mm. which, mm -hmm. if offered here, we will not do. Mm. Not so much also because of the nature of the job. But it is not attractive here. People will even ask, oh, it, I hear this guy is a lawyer, but look mm. look at him, the kind of job he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's selling bread. But if that is what is going to end, as one, one graduate, I understand, who, who is um, into this bread business, really was lucky that other people held on for him, in bashing those who were critical of him. How can you finish university and be baking bread and selling bread? That is the kind of thing I'm talking <laughs> about. We are not concerned so much about the legitimate job that will bring us income, mm. but how clean it is, how you wake up and you wear your dark mm. suit and black tie and things like that. Very well. But it goes beyond that. Mm. Very well. We need to take a break. When we come back, we'll hear um, from Honorable Sam George mm. on the perspectives of the economy and other sectors that we have flagged for discussion on the show. You're watching and listening to New Day Saturday Edition. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to New Day Saturday edition. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7. And we're streaming online on 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. Just before the break, we're looking at some aspects of the president's second State of the Nation address. We touched on the economy. We dovetailed into areas of unemployment and, indeed, some aspects of agric. But we'll be expanding some more on that. I'll turn... Now to um, Mr. Sam George to give us his perspectives on this, particularly looking at the conversation so far. We are looking at um, Honorable Sam George, the where um, Mr. Paul left off, looking at employment and how we are looking at jobs. You know, the, ne the need for government to create the enabling environment so that people can, on their own, you know, create opportunities for job or employment. 
Um, the, pre the president, I believe, indeed, the Minister for Finance in his budget talked about the nation build a score where some number of um, job opportunities will be created for some youth in the areas of agriculture, tax collection, and all of that. Questions about sustainability of these have come in, and I believe the minority has had some strong views on this. Looking at job creation within um, the context of the budget, and again, what the president said in his State of the Nation address. Tell us your perspectives. Well, let me say that this State of the Nation's address was more of a shout out opportunity for His Excellency the President to give shout out to some of his favorite ministers and bestow accolades upon them and was very light on substance. I mean, the president tried to make <laughs> a big point or a meal out of economic indicators, macroeconomic indicators. Now, this is the same president who, when he was candidate, told us, like Honorable Obiyama said, no figures will go chop. You know, again, even though he was, this was the second State of the Nation's address, his second address, second year in second year of office, he still sought to place the blame for the failures of his government on the doorstep of the Eswal Mahama administration. The same president who as candidate in 2009, when he lost the 2008 elections to President Mills, and President Mills tried to recount the challenges that he had been saddled with taking over from the Kufu administration, gave the very famous phrase, if it's broke, Mr. President, fix it. You wonder why President Akufuado today is not thinking of fixing it, but is still whining. President Akufuado tried to raise issues and make big fact about the fact that the economy grew in by over 7% in 2017 by provisional figures and will go by close to 9%. Uh, President Akufuado, again, must be mindful of the fact that we in the minority will hold him to strict account of what history tells us. The EIU, the IMF, and the World Bank, <laughs> as far back as far back as May uh, sorry of Sorry to cut you, but I see you've set your own questions here because I asked a specific <laughs> question. I'm not getting that. And we, ha we are working within time. At some uh, point, I'm, if I'm, I have to... I'm addressing to the economy. I'm, I'm going yes. to the figures that the president uh -huh. churned out. He churned these figures out, and I could read them from, from his statement. He churned out the fact that the World Bank and the IMF had promised, had projected that Ghana was going to grow by almost nine percent. Mm -hmm. True or false? No, no, he did. Of yes, course, and that's what I'm addressing. That, and that's what, and that's what I'm addressing. That those figures, those figures are not new figures that the IMF is putting out. I'm saying that as far back as May of 2016, if the president will cast his mind back, the World Bank, the IMF, and the EIU put out those figures as growth rates. In fact, mm -hmm. they said that Ghana was going to grow by 5% in 2016, we're going to grow by 7.4% in 2017, and 8.3% in 2018. So if today he's rehashing those figures, those are not new figures. And the reasons for those figures were given in the, that report. It was the investment in the 10 fields, the Sankofa oil fields, the 7 billion ENI fields. So these are all Mahama legacies. So if today the president is going to come, and after a year in office, all he can do is rehash old things that we knew, you ask yourself, where exactly are we going on as an economy? Is our economy really growing? And, and I went, you know, I, did, I just did a Google search because as soon as we started discussing the issue of employment, okay, and I'm reading from TV3's website. Uh, TV3 did a story on the 29th, Monday 29th, February 2016. It's on your website at 2.15, the full statement, Akufuado's real state of the nation's address. Okay, and if you read that State of the Nations address, he critiqued President Mahama's 2016 State of the Nations address, mm -hmm. focused solely on, on, on employment. Employment was one of the key things. This is, this is what he said about, this is one of the key things he said, and I'll just read from your website what, what you put up there. He said, while the President of the Republic rose before Parliament in fulfillment of his constitutional obligation to deliver his message on the State of the Nation last Thursday, I watched on television in the hope that he would capture the mood and the difficulty that face our people daily. I waited to hear him admit that we are in a crisis, and I willed him on to offer a glimmer of hope and ask all of us Ghanaians to help resolve the crisis we find ourselves in. He goes on to talk about the fact that millions of Ghanaians did not have jobs. In this year's State of the Nations address, you listened and hoped that the president would also give us a glimmer of hope. The president was silent on jobs. If you take his, his, his talk of jobs, he mentions the National Builder Score. He's been in office for over a year. 
He's had the opportunity to meet the press at least on two occasions. And even in the last meeting with the press, what did he say? He said he did not have the figures on how much jobs is created. Post that, his own minister, who he calls uh, an asset or a champion of the Ghanaian farmers, the minister for Agric, had put out figures of 745,000 jobs that had been created. Strangely, the president shied away from that figure. The president did not speak about it in his entire State of the Nation's address. If it is true that the president's ministry of Agri alone had produced or created 745,000 jobs, you'd think that the president would have mentioned it in the State but of the Nation's address. Do you have any reason to doubt that figure? Absolutely. That figure is false. It's not true. On what basis? And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. Look, this whole planting for food and jobs, and when the president spoke about it in his 2017 State of the Nation's address, I personally challenged the president, and he's been silent on it, that the planting for food and jobs was not his initiative. It was an old initiative called MAPLE, Modernizing Agriculture for Productivity at the Local Economy. And the structure of that project, which had received Canadian funding as far back as 2015, has, has been changed fundamentally. When you say you've created 745,000 jobs, it means you've taken 745,000 Ghanaians who hitherto did not have a job, did not have an employment, and put them in a job. But when you go and pick 745,000, and even that figure is debatable, farmers who already had farms, who were already employed, already doing something, and just write down their names and say you're bringing them under a program to give them support. You've not created jobs. But that is that, that, isn't that number, um, doesn't that number include extension officers, farm hands who would be spraying, weeding, and all of that? If it goes the budget, beyond the farmers. No, if, it, if you take the it? budget, if you take the budget, a little over 3,000 extension officers and sprayers. And that's in the budget presented to Parliament by Mr. Ken Ofuriata. A little over 3,000 have been employed for that. So 3,000 and 745,000 is a huge disparity. And that's why we're challenging that figure. And that's why the president himself shied away from it, because he knew he would be held to strict proof. Now, you see, on the economy, back to the economy, when you want to talk about the economy, for me, as a member of parliament, I'm sure as Honorable Obiyama would also agree, what our constituents are interested in is not the 8.3% growth rate. And like Mr. Yaopong pointed out, the growth of our economy it's not real. It's cosmetic. Because when we say our economy is growing by 8.3%, no, I, no <laughs> I, I, I'm saying that th okay, those are my words that it's not right. real. Okay. okay, you you try to point the, create the, the issue about Okay, so you're saying they're not real. That's your opinion, right? And, and development. Yes, yes, and that's what I'm saying right. that what we are really looking out for as Ghanaians is development. Mm. Okay, what we are getting are growth figures. Now, what I'm saying is not real or it's cosmetic. It's this growth areas, if you take the 8.3% that we're going to grow by, 4.3% of that is in oil. Take the oil sector. Is that sector in the hands of Ghanaians? The remaining 4% that we're growing. Honorable Obiyama talks about industry growing by 17%. Fantastic. Who owns those industries? Are they Ghanaians? Is that, is that, growth, is that growth sitting in Ghana? Or are these are this growth indices in the hands of foreign entities like telcos, like mining companies, where all of that wealth is being repatriated to their home countries? And so Ghanaians are really not feeling anything. Now, let me give you the real indicator of the, but of the Ghanaian economy. But on the issue of the investments by foreigners and yeah. all, isn't it the case that we as a people have over the years consistently shortchanged ourselves by how we negotiate in terms of these contracts and investments that come in that's a point i will concede on but you see yes this government, so this government, this government ha is building a pension where even in the few instances where we have sought to create ghanaian businesses mm -hmm. they're killing those ghanaian businesses okay the case of extinct cubic for example is one the case of knet is another do I you mean, really want to say the extinct cubic is one of such because really absolutely that is, anyways we're going to that we're going to that but that's fine yes. yeah. <laughs> look going to that, on the yeah. 7th of january and this this is what my constituents are concerned about. Mm. On the 7th of January 2017, Anilonko Avgari was six Ghana cities. On the 7th of January 2018, it is 10 Ghana cities. That is a 66.7% increase. Mm. A gallon of petrol was 15 Ghana cities. On the 7th of January 2017, it is 22 cities, 5 pesos. That's an increase of 47%. A bag of rice, 25 kilos, was 105 Ghana cities on the 7th of January. Today, or on the 7th of January 2018, it had risen to 195 percent, mm. uh, 95 Ghana cities. That is 85.7 percent increase. A bucket of tomatoes, okay, and this is creating marital problems. Take it from me, mm -hmm. because <laughs> a bucket of tomatoes, a bucket of tomatoes mm -hmm. which used to cost 20 Ghana cities, is costing 40 Ghana cities today. That is a 100 percent increase. Now, don't forget that the man who is giving his wife the money for that has not seen a 100 percent increase 
in his income or his, his, his revenue. A tube of yam, which used to cost eight cities, is now costing 15 Ghana cities. That's 87.5%. Look, I can go on and on. A bag of omo, 300 gram of omo, which used to cost 45 Ghana cities on the 7th of January 2017, is costing 58 Ghana cities on the 7th of January 2018. That is a 28.9% increase. The mo most mind-boggling one, a small basket of pepper, on the 7th of January 2017, used to cost one city 50 pesos. On the 7th of January 2018, it's costing 100 Ghana cities. That is 6,566.7% <laughs> increase. Mm. It's, it's just showing you how much pepe this government is showing to the ordinary <laughs> Ghanaian. <laughs> but, but you see, even salt, salt, which used to cost one city for a small bag of salt, is now costing one city 20 pesos, 20% increase. These are the real indicators. And I can go on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. This, this for me, is what we in the minority will call our Ahutre market basket, okay, our own well. CPI basket, okay, well. where at the end of the day, you realize that in the real sense of the word, in the real sense of mm -hmm. the word, the Ghanaian is worse off one year under this, this government. The, the, you can give the flowery indicators. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the last thing on employment, which I will say is, and, Please and wrap up for yeah, me, yes. I'm wrapping up. Mm -hmm. As the president spoke about the senior minister, and let me just read what he mm -hmm. said. Just this morning, the respected senior minister, Yao Safu Mafo, launched the Digital Marketing and Entrepreneurship Program mm -hmm. at the Accra Digital Center. Now, the Accra Digital Center is another legacy of John Dramani Mahama. This is what the president said. This program, with 10 regional training centers, has already recruited 3,000 young unemployed people to undergo a three-month all-expense-paid training. I am happy to announce that Ecobank Ghana Limited has already offered to engage all 3,000 young people after the training program. Mm -hmm. This is just the tip of the iceberg. <coughs> this is a classic example of how misplaced the priorities of this government is. Why do I say so? You are spending taxpayers' money to train 3,000 people in digital marketing and entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? And you come and stand in front of the people's representative and tell us that Ecobank is going to employ the 3,000 entrepreneurs. What are these entrepreneurs supposed to do? They're supposed to go out into the market, be helped to be set up. That's why the digital center was created. Mm. We create these entrepreneurs. We use the youth, youth enterprise support, which President Mahama had set up the years, which has now been rechristened the NEIP. Use that program as a yardstick to help these 3,000 entrepreneurs build new jobs. But what are you doing? You're building entrepreneurs who are going to be employed. It tells Very you the well. priorities of this government. Very well. Thank you, Honorable Sam George, for that. <laughs> Rather, <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> Seriously, Maybe yes. I, I will. I will come to Prof and then go to um, well, Mr. Obi for for, uh, for a, a for a quick just a follow up. Please do follow that from my. No, because I was a minute, let me let me finish with Prof okay. and then That's yes, we'll do that. Yes. So please take notes of this. I'll come to you quickly. Yes, Prof. Response. Yes. Issues that we are raising. We need to put them in context. Mm. Uh, the issue you raise about sustainability mm -hmm. is a very critical one. We have seasonability also. Certain seasons go with certain jobs. Right. But it also goes with prices. Sometimes the prices of tomatoes can go very high because the supply is very low. But sometimes when there is bumper harvest, the supply will be very high and the demand relatively stable. You see prices going down. So uh, in terms of those price changes, and I think the political tone of our conversation is too high. Because, <laughs> yes, I let mean, us try and remain and national. Mm -hmm in our thinking because each of the political <laughs> leaders were paid by Ghana when they do their job. Mm. Just like if I'm a CEO of a company, I'm being paid. When I finish, there's nothing called legacy, legacy. You provided very important services, you have been paid for it. But the moment you sound national, then it is, yes, we are benefiting from our presidents. All of them, they contributed their quota. In other words... Governance, I'm, they say, it's a continuum. One it, finishes, it, another comes to continue. Continues. You build on the successes or gains made by the I'm previous. I'm not saying so. we shouldn't go to... We shouldn't look at some of the political dimensions. But We can't do without the them. Tone, <laughs> if the tone is as though mm. we are 
on a political platform. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have a feeling of being at the wrong place. No. But let me say sustainability. It's, 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 I mean, it's his right to speak <laughs> that way. So far as it's not being, it's not malicious to anybody, it's not, you know, he can go ahead. Uh, I mean, know, I can... Maybe what I said, I, I didn't say it properly. Okay. But you, you know we have political platform. Or if exactly, this is political I'm definitely platform, not. then... <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely not. We have some yes. emphasis on mm -hmm. certain things mm -hmm. there. No, the concept growth is just increasing size. Mm. So when we say the economy has growth, it's a rate of change from a base level. You take the difference divided by the base and see whether it's increasing or decreasing. But when the growth rate is coming down, it doesn't mean the level of the economy is going down. It only means the increase is not going fast. So the increase can be 14%, but it can also be 3%. It still increased anyway. That 14% was because of some idle resources within the system. Mm -hmm. We call it outlier. It, that is it not part of our trend. Mm -hmm. It just came and then it goes. So there is a sustained trend in every economy. If it is downtrending, it's bad. Mm -hmm. If it is steady, or at least upward, that is best. But development from the both policy and economic perspective is composed of that growth itself. Mm -hmm. But there must be structural changes. Mm -hmm. A lot of scientific technology infusion into the system. The way we do things should change. So farming should not be still whole exactly. grows and cut and, and the cut and slash, mm. cut slash and burn. No, the technology and science and mathematics must be coming in. But that's uh, what I don't understand. Sorry to cut you off. With the agri sector, consistently we say agri is the backbone of our economy. Consistently we say we need to mechanize our agriculture. We need to do this. We need to, but we seem not to be doing it. And if there's any area of the budget we need to cut down on. A Greek is uh, one of those areas. Those are part of the policy debate mm. that should continue. Currently, services sector is taking a bigger share of our GDP. And this is followed by agriculture sector. And then we have industry. But I am not too sure a Greek alone can be the backbone. Mm. Every sector of the economy, but we always have, in, by way of principle, the nexus. The nexus is the value addition. Right. That is in the industrial sector. So when we have primary and you are able to add value, not only agriculture by definition, but also mining. Mm. We export gold ores from this country. We must have jewelry, gold, plated uh, rings, and so on and so forth. So value addition, that is the royal road to job creation. <laughs> that is where you really do it. So when the structures, we have to focus heavily on structures when they are changing, then it is going to be linking education to science, to mathematics, to art of production and so on. The last aspect of development, but there are many other aspects, sure. is equity. How those benefits you are taking from uh, the development mm -hmm. is benefiting every person. Mm. If you develop and only some 5% are miserably rich, mm. <laughs> and then about 95% they are really, really poor, then what are you doing? There will be crisis. And then, of course, there will be uh, problems of sustainability. Now, in terms of artificial intelligence, that is a very important thing. But it's actually technology which is in the base. It's improving. When productivity rises because of this technology science infusion, mm. 
people will lose jobs that are supposed to do the jobs that are now being done by the technology. But human beings must create the technology. Yes. They must go out there, train, and go into scientific product creation. Ghana And that is you're looking a at consumer. our educational yes. system, which is already in, well, <laughs> not, not, no, not only education. The best education is right. just the human capitalization. But you create the necessary environment mm. for people to move around, to, to improve upon themselves. For instance, those who do... Prof, I need you to wrap up for me. Yes. Me, so because we, are, we need to move on to some other topics. But yes, just wrapping up for me. In terms of the sustainability issue on this uh, loss of jobs mm -hmm. as a result of scientific innovation, I think that at times we confuse lack of jobs with frictional unemployment. Mm. Sometimes people will have to learn new technology, learn new techniques, learn new skills to be able to move into different types of... If they don't move, we will not be able to sustain it. I'm building on that point which he has raised. I think it's a very important point. Which one is this? That is the sustainability. Very well, yes, that's true. I mean, you talk about the various components of, you know, unemployment, jobs and all, but there's the other side to which is people who are un, I mean like unemployable mm -hmm. because they lack certain, certain skills, skills, which in itself is also another, I mean, area we can go into, but not today. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, um, I'll I first, I'll have to react generally to the posture of NDC. Um, the uh, posture yeah, yeah, is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go, and that's what... Yeah. <laughs> that's what no, no, it's, it's you, repeated it sure? here. Uh -huh. The interesting part of it is that when things are going well, they say that will give us the credit. Mm. We built the foundation for you to be uh, touting that mm. you've done so much. And at the same time, they will say that um, there's nothing to show. If you really built that legacy, and you claim that it's that legacy that we are standing on, how do you also see that with the same bed that there's nothing to show? Uh, it's, it's a paradox. I don't know why they think they can keep on doing this. The other aspect of it is that if you are quoting the president, then you have to quote him well. If you're quoting the president, you have to quote him well. Now you're saying that it's entrepreneurship, but now they're saying they're going to employ all of them. If you read the statement, it says that this program with 10 regional training centers has already recruited 3,000 young unemployed people to undergo a three-month all-expenses-paid training. I'm happy to announce that Ecobank Ghana Limited has already <laughs> offered to engage all 3,000 young people after the training program. No, the I'm fact that... Just a minute. No, 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 just a minute. Yes, sorry. The no, fact that... There's a line before just a minute. that. Wait, wait, that wait, line. Just, just a minute. I'm following listen, that. Sam, listen, just a minute. Please. Hold on. I'm following when, that as well. When you're talking about Ken White... When you're talking about Ken White... I'm not No, no, no. Please, just wait a minute. What the president said is just this morning, the respected senior minister, Yawa Safumafo, launched the digital marketing and entrepreneurship program. What did I wrong before? So the, oh. so you please, are, please don't you, interject. Let you him ended up by saying that it's please. interpretation program. Mm -hmm. So why are they saying that? Mr. Sam George, please take it's it easy. He's marketing. on the floor. The Let whole him. program is mm -hmm. digital marketing and entrepreneurship program mm -hmm. at the Accra Digital Center. Mm -hmm. So okay. if Ecobago is saying that they will employ 3,000, mm -hmm. where, where, yes. where is the anomaly or where is the. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So please, if you could encode very well, then about employment, the president is saying that come much, 100,000 young persons will be assisted, will be employed in various sectors, mm. health, education, revenue generation, sanitation, agri. Much is just less month. He says everything has been put in place, and then there are stakeholder meetings, and we sure that with the fine tuning being put in place, by March, 100,000 people would be employed. Let's wait for March. March is just less month. This is in addition to other youth employment initiatives. The entrepreneurship mm -hmm. side, the youth employment the agency side, etc. In this country, when 2016, I have the State of the Nation address here, 2016, mm -hmm. the president said we were going to employ 100,000 under YEA. At the end of the day, YEA was even suspended. The funding for YEA was even suspended under the Common Fund. So please, let's be more objective in these things. Fine, as Prof said, we may be behaving. Uh, like your like political campaign, platform. Yeah. fine. <laughs> if you're talking about conditions now, 
They're talking about conditions now and comparing prices and saying that this has done this and that. I can assure you that if NDC was <laughs> in power, it would have been far worse. <laughs> with the way they were running the economy. Very speculative. Yeah, it's not speculative. That's I mean, speculative. I'm talking by, uh, with figures. Mm. I mean, if, you, your, if your deficit is so high, if your growth rate is so low, if your interest rates are so high, and we're going to continue this way, we'd have been in a worse situation well. than now. We are With what we have put in place, obviously... By my... Are, by my... Yes. By my... I mean, talk, it's obvious. We have done over it's one and a half I mean, hours on this. If NEC was in power, on. would have been... Yeah, have we need... Yeah. Oh, no, no. Some, some it's Please. obvious. Let's just move. We've moved on. The figures no, are there. Said, no, no, no. Let's don't move lie. In. Just a minute. Yes. The so we can now... Very well. So you give them two Mr. Well, well, just, a, one. just a quick one. No. I will come to it's you. It's a reaction don't, to some of your Don't <laughs> do those things <laughs> to suggest no anything. No, I beg, no. yes. If you put it in <laughs> such a hole, we'll and then you say that you'll have been, been on top go. of a well, mountain. Well, I think, I think that uh, when we look at prices, uh, I, I had thought it's a, it's a factor of inflation. Mm -hmm. yes. It's it impacts on inflation. So I'm wondering how all these uh, figures that we've been favored by is uh, honorable Sam George, George have not reflected in terms of inflation because inflation has been Drop. reduced from 17 plus mm -hmm. in 2016 to 11.8 yes. mm -hmm. and 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 perhaps well i'm not doubting it but it means that it may also be then putting money in the pocket of the farmers mm -hmm. for example because we are told that now they have ready market especially because of the bumper and mm -hmm. um, Center, or, or what do you call yes, it? The uh, that, yes, that I think that is traceable to Professor Mills. Professor Mills. Also. Yeah. Let's, let's You're go. giving credit. Like, yes, <laughs> and and also the free education yeah. because they they stand they the to direct. get these uh, products, and therefore the those that may have been wasted, and now have ready market for it, and they, they compete in terms of pricing. Well, I understand that even the the uh, the negative side is that the locals may not be able to afford it as much as the um, the managers of the schools are. So we may have to look at that aspect and, and perhaps find out that then why don't we rather ensure that we create these things as Prof said, we add value to it so that even if the price is high, it will still be reflected and be in the pockets of the very people mm. who are to use the money to buy other things. Very well. Quickly, I move to some George yes. for and your reaction. And then and we, we take and a break and, and, and we'll come back to something. I mean, very when, brief, yes. please. When Prof spoke <laughs> about legacies, you cannot you cannot discount legacies in any in any in any discussion because you put liabilities on the doorstep of a government. You must also put on the assets of that government. Again, when it comes to the issues of seasonability that he raised with the figures that I put out. The figures I put out were not comparing different seasons of, of, of farming seasons. I'm comparing 7th of January 2017 and 7th of January 2018. So it therefore means that the seasons are the same. So the argument of seasonability actually respectfully is mute. It doesn't even come in here because whatever the seasons were and the supply and demands in January 2017, are the same in January. We've not changed. We've not changed. We've, we've not changed, we've not changed <laughs> this period. Now, 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 now. When, when it comes, when, when it comes, when it comes to the, when it comes to the issues of, of, uh, like, take for example, that the point that my my, my senior brother Yao Pong just made now about the fact that there's a buffer stock and so it means there's more. If you listen to the president, the president actually spoke about the fact that we've had to do more imports of grains from the Sahelian, our Sahelian neighbors. So if we're seeing higher prices on the market, it is not reflective of higher money or, or increased revenue to the Ghanaian farmer because most of these grains and tomatoes are coming in from our Sahelian neighbors. Again, that again, the point you make about the fact that these increases we're seeing are in 60, 70 percent, and our in inflation rate, we're told, is at 11 percent, is again another disconnect between the kinds of figures that we put out. And that's why the Ghanaian people are saying that the macroeconomic indicators that are churned out are not reflective in very our well. pocket. Honorable, thank you very much. We will need to take a break here. When we come back, we move on to the s cubic case. You're watching New Day Saturday edition. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching and listening to New Day Saturday Edition live on TV3, also live on 3 FM 92.7 and online around the world on 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. We'll move on um, from that heated debate on <laughs> the president's second state of the nation to the extant cubic um, K 
case and the ruling of the courts that came through this week, I believe on Wednesday. We're looking at this um, situation following the Minister of Land and Natural Resources um, cancellation or revocation of mining leases that were granted to Exton Cubic um, in 2016. The matter went to court and the court has made some pronouncements in regards or regarding the minister's actions which sought to you know cancel um, these mining leases. I will start off with um, Mr. Yaopon here to tell us exactly what you know just give us the highlights of the judgment what it means and matters arising we'll pick it up from there yes thank you very much i mean this is an <coughs> interesting mm -hmm. um, <coughs> development uh, i was in court for part of it mm -hmm. getting to the end and we were also favored with a copy of the uh, certified copy of the decision mm -hmm. and the the decision is of, of course uh, various persons have uh, understood it in various in ways, ways <laughs> or different ways yeah sometimes tainted by their own preconceived expectations mm -hmm. and, and some also based on sheer dislike uh, if you like that I, I didn't expect this and it has mm. it has happened <coughs> the main point there as the judge or the court highlighted mm -hmm. was not generally to determine the legality or otherwise of any right that has been or purportedly been granted the company mm -hmm. but that whether or not the procedure by which the leases were purportedly uh, cancelled or revoked or invalidated mm -hmm whether it was consistent with the general rules of um, rules of natural justice that give a person a hearing before you condemn him or before he suffers a liability. And that is a general principle that we all know. But in, in the judgment, the court went ahead to make very profound statements. Mm -hmm. <coughs> For example, at paragraph 102, The court says, and I quote, to my mind, without a parliamentary ratification, the applicant, that's the company, cannot be said to have a mineral right based on the wording of the lease and the constitutional provision and case law. And this is what I deem to be the point that I will highlight mm. because it is so significant. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so... But then the court went ahead to say that to the extent that the state executed three mining leases in favor of the company, the company has a certain right yes. which entitles it at least to a hearing before those leases are revoked. Well, as you know, I mean, law is generally like a coin. And I'm going to take another perspective to this one. <coughs> and, and also sound less legalistic. <laughs> but we know that when a matter comes to court, mm -hmm. the general rule is that when an issue of illegality surfaces, so to speak, from the proceedings, or the papers filed, a court must not close its eyes to it, no matter how that illegality came to its attention. And an illegality generally imputes non-compliance with law. You can also call it unlawful act. And there is no law which is greater than the Constitution in Ghana. That is our supreme law. Mm. And Article 2681 provides that any transaction, contract, or undertaking involving the grant of a right or concession by or on behalf of any person, including the government of Ghana, to any other person or body of person, howsoever described, for the exploitation of any mineral 
water or other natural resource of Ghana made or entered into after the coming into force of this constitution shall be subject to ratification by parliament. The Minerals and Mining Act also repeats the same provision. In fact, the leases that were issued to the company also incorporates this provision in it, and the judge highlighted it. And there are many authorities from the Supreme Court also that where a person applies for certiorari, which is what this company applied for, and the technical grounds... And the explanation of the certiorari is well, to... So yeah. you don't, you know, confuse, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Forgive me. The very thing I tried not to Exactly. Do, but, well, it just means that somebody acted like a judge. In so doing, he has varied your rights, usually to your detriment mm. or adversely. So you go to court, or it could even be a lower court. So you go to court, the high court, if it is a lower court, a court lower than the high court, you go to the high court, that this person has taken a decision which has adversely affected my right, but he didn't give me a hearing, for example. Or he didn't, he gave me a hearing, but he did not That's give me adequate opportunity to be heard. So he writes to me today and says, tomorrow, come and answer questions. Or you, like some of the companies do, they will query you in the morning and say, by close of day today, bring your, uh, your answers to these queries. That is, giving the person a hearing, but not adequate opportunity to be heard. So you can go to court on this basis, and it had been the position that the court has to determine the matter on this basis. In recent times, these uh, principles have evolved, and the Supreme Court has heard consistently that even after the party, the applicant has been able to establish these um, technical grounds, one of which I have stated, giving a hearing and so mm -hmm. on. But his conduct is such that he should not be entitled to it. For example, he has engaged in non-compliance with law. He has, in the course of the proceedings, sought to conceal material information from the court. Or even the conduct of the party in court and his lawyer should disentitle the person from being granted the order for certiorari, even though he has established that he was not given a hearing. And the authorities are many, not, not to bother the yeah, rest of yeah. us. So I would have, <coughs> and of course they say that it is like, um, it's in the nature of equity. I mean, one of the most uh, profound equitable maxims or principle, which is generally known, is when you are going to equity, go with what? Clean hands. And you cannot go with clean hands, or your hands cannot be said to be clean when you have violated the constitutional provision or any other law. So I would have gone further beyond establishing that yes, and, and I, I agree with the court that the minister or generally matters like this should be left to the court to determine. Mm -hmm. But the point is, what did the minister, that is the minister for lands, what did he do? If the leases, as the court clearly identified and held, are void for non-compliance with the Constitution, then the minister canceled nothing. The minister invalidated nothing. Because if something is void in law, it doesn't exist. And you cannot cancel a non-existent matter. So to, the, to my mind, yes, the minister's conduct may have been ultra virus his powers, beyond his powers. But to the extent that what he did was nothing in law. It means he did nothing wrong. So there was nothing to be cancelled. But in any case, if, he, he, yes, if yes, there was nothing to cancel, because what they are holding doesn't exist. Because the law that brings it into effect, which is a constitution, if it is not complied with, you are just holding a mere paper or a matter in terms of science. So, but then, let's say that the, what he did was wrong. When the matter comes to court in a situation like this, then the court is seized with jurisdiction, 
even if it is what we call a summary uh, proceedings like application okay. for certiorari and so on, it doesn't matter the situation. So I'm saying that. And you're saying this because the judge clearly focused on what he said was the subject of the application, yes. which had to do with the cancellation of the procedure the leases for and the, not for the, the procedure leading up yes. to the signing of the leases or the execution yeah, of the that leases. That is interesting, but I'm saying that. But beyond that, mm. the court made a fundamental finding that the leases did not comply with. Did not comply with one the procedure for obtaining mm. leases under the Minerals and Mining Act, and also it has not been ratified by Parliament, and therefore it's not a void. It, it, the, the Supreme Court held in similar situation in the Wyomi case, Isophoton case, Faro Atlantic, Balkan Energy. In all these cases, they said where there is a mandatory provision that a contract cannot come into effect unless it is ratified by Parliament. What you are holding doesn't exist. It's void. Very it's well. Null and void. So Mr. let me conclude. Yes, so please conclude. I would, have, move on. If I would have gone beyond mere declaration of the voidability or the nullity of the document for non-compliance, and also then hold that in that case, because of the conduct of both the minister and the company, then this person who is the applicant and whose conduct I must also consider should not be entitled to the grant of the certiorari because their hands were tainted with non-compliance with the constitutional provision and the Minerals and Mining Act, which is a very important act. So I'm saying that it is, it is a wonderful judge, uh, mm -hmm. ruling or decision, but I, if I were the judge, would have gone beyond that and hold that to that extent the... <coughs> applicants should not be entitled. But you also know that the okay. court refused. They brought two reliefs or prayers. One, a declaration that the minister's conduct should, uh, should be declared void mm -hmm. for uh, ultra ultra -virus. Ultra virus, And two, for an injunction. And that, for me, is a very important uh, relief they sought. Injunction to restrain the government. Mm -hmm. Of course, minerals are vested in the president as a trustee for That's all right. of us. That's right. So to restrain the president from extracting or causing to, uh, to be extracted, minerals will also mean that our, our hands, all our hands will be tied up against our back. The court refused it mm. because the court said, because of the nature of the proceedings, it didn't have the power mm. to consider that and dismiss that aspect. Very well. That's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I'll quickly move to... Um, uh, Professor Dudonu here. Then I come to um, yeah. um, Honourable Obi, and then analysis. and and the, 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 <laughs> yes, Mr. Sam George here. Now, from the facts as narrated by the judge in the, the the ruling, these mining leases were executed or signed in the dying days of the NDC government, 29 December 2016 specifically, and per the procedural or the statutory obligations or indeed constitutional provisions, this had um, or needed parliamentary ratification. That wasn't done. A new government comes into office, comes to meet the situation. Whether or not it was in the handing over notes, or not, we don't know about that. But a new minister comes into office. Clearly, there were some obligations on the part of the minister and indeed the company who are holding this lease because they were to have submitted these leases, certified copies, true copies, to the minister, who would then have it laid before parliament. But clearly none of these things happened, which has led to the situation where we have the judge making those you know, comments in there about the processes leading up to the signing of the leases. Now this brings into question the failings of if you like, our leaders in terms of what is to be done. But you're looking at a very peculiar period, which is a transition period, a whole lot of issues coming up. In that circumstances, with the new government coming in, Prof, what options did the minister have? Actually, you know, I'm enthused by one critical point. If a case doesn't exist, and you are 
mm -hmm. trying to fight that case, then you are fighting nothing. Um, I, I have three concerns to use to answer uh, the question what mm -hmm. he could have done. The first one is equity. It must come clean. Was it established? No. Why? Because the procedures that were followed were tinted. It should come clean so that we can see through it. It was not even tinted, it was translucent. So there <laughs> were serious distortions there. We couldn't come up. Then the second one is there is the supreme law of our country. Parliamentary ratification has been required. It was not done. And those examples that are set by our councillor were very much in place. They were not done. So the, he didn't acquire anything, actually. It is not very easy for me to say what the minister could have done because I am not too sure whether first and foremost he is a lawyer. He's not a That's why you have the AG's yes. department. I was going mm -hmm. to go into that, but you've mm -hmm. preempted that. That's uh -huh. why you have the AG's department. Do so they consult, for instance? It's a very important it's question. Because in, in public policy, we have some stages or phases we go through. One stage is consultation, so that you can come <coughs> clean and clear in your decision making, so that your decision is an informed decision exactly. you are making. So if he's not a lawyer, then he should find out, at least from the, the lawyer of mm -hmm. the president. The yeah, state the at all. The lawyers or maybe the, the Lands Commission board. Mm -hmm. board. The Commission Whether board. Whether he has the authority to even write that letter. Mm -hmm. I, I want to believe that he has job description, what he has to do. And he is being guided by a good HR. If that is so, he should not assume certain uh, positions and rules mm -hmm. in his in him being the minister. So I, I think he's trying to do something right mm -hmm. that is trying to <laughs> cancel a certain contract. But scientifically, and then science in this sense doesn't mean the political <laughs> <direction>. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the processes they have followed mm -hmm. is not right. The minister should have done some little bit of research, finding out and pose the question, what do we do? Yep. The, the courts would have cleaned this long time ago. That's my position. Honorable, yeah. yes. On that, could, could there have been a possibility where, yes, the minister could have placed before parliament these mining leases for the required processes in, in parliament, <coughs> either to, you know, approve it or not, and then carry on? Or that time had well, lapsed? Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I must state that I'm glad that this matter went to court. Because mm -hmm. until it went to court, there were all sorts of speculations and attributions, etc. What really is the case? The case is that the Minerals Commission purported to have Go approved ahead. or granted three leases, Chiraso, uh, Impasaso, Chichire, to a mining company on 29 December 2016. And the majority shareholder of that company is your mama's brother, Ibrahim Mahama. That is could, the matter. Could, could, yes. so could, we, could we leave those? Yeah, it's, it's very important for everybody to know <laughs> I that. think we I, can have this I, conversation. I, I saw that council <laughs> as much as possible wanted to. Yeah, but well, exactly yes, because <laughs> the, I don't think it was situation. captured. I don't think it was captured in the ruling, was it? <laughs> You it wasn't captured in the ruling. It wasn't part of the first caption. No, he's excited. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, beyond, yes. <laughs> so beyond this, the <laughs> argument in the public was that it's because it's, the, 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 mm. it's for the president's brother. Mm. That's why the government mm. is acting that way. Mm. I'm saying that I'm glad he went to court because mm. in the court, what the court said was that the minister 
should not have used just a mere letter to say that he had revoked the mining leases. But more fundamentally, one, the Minerals Commission did not have any authority to have granted the three leases to that company. So what they purported to have done on 29 December 2016 was wrong. Number two, even if they had granted the thing which was wrong, it had to go to Parliament, which okay. it hadn't gone to Parliament. Apart from the fact that they did not even comply with EPA obligations and regulations. These are the issues. So what the court said was that, fine, you've come to me. You said that I should um, Look quash, at a certain issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. quash what the minister had done. And that I should even place in Janssen on the minister and government not to interfere what you are, you are doing. <laughs> in the first part, on the first leg, I'm ready to say that the minister could have used other means, which I'm trying to even really find out. Because the question you asked was, could he have brought it to parliament? Mm -hmm. If I think it's illegal, how does he bring it to parliament in the first place? Because the, the court has found that Minerals Commission did not have that authority to do what they did. So if the thing is illegal, how does he bring it to parliament? Is he carrying legality to parliament and hoping that parliament will endorse that illegality? So perhaps parliament would have detected that error. No, if he has, if he has been brought, if he has detected that error, why does he carry it to parliament? You understand? So obviously he didn't think that parliament was an option, as the court has found out. Mm. So what would have been the best um, option for the minister instead of just saying that I have okay. cancelled it? But the main issue by the applicant was that we wanted to be heard. We wanted to show that we had complied with all those mm. things. And that we thought that we hadn't been heard. Which the court said, okay, uh, by the rules and regulations, obviously, minister, you exceeded your powers. Mm. Minister exceeding his powers, is, 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 that's why the courts are there to rule on these things. And the court has ruled. But the fundamental thing is that as far as the court is concerned, all these illegalities are illegal. They have not been ratified by Parliament. And if they have not been ratified by Parliament, you cannot no rights conferred to be holding any lease. Mm -hmm. So the court said, apart from the fact that by my powers, I cannot make any consequential orders. In which case, I, I cannot place any injunction. That's right. It's obvious that, <laughs> apart from not placing any injunction, you don't have any lease to say that so you are going to So let me ask this question. In, in, within within the context of the facts as being played out like this, mm -hmm. did extend cubic even have the capacity to bring this application then that should have been the issue that yeah. you're bringing a legal no, no, to, no, to no, court no, for me no, to, no, to, no, to to pronounce on. Okay. Yes. that's a, that's an issue uh -huh. that we can we can even uh -huh. interrogate are you bringing something which is illegal for me to uh, because the to, basis of this application is that you as a mining as, as a holder of mineral rights mm, yes. then you can bring but if indeed hey, what is out. that you, you you didn't have it yes. then question as to Capacity even when the application comes up. Court. Separate mm -hmm. cases that when it comes to ratification, it's very fundamental that Parliament would have to play its role. Mm. So if it hasn't come to Parliament, and the impression out there was that everything was okay, but it's, the minister doesn't want to bring it to Parliament because it's the president's brother. But now it's even before now that even the leases itself were illegal. Mm. So if they were illegal, how was he supposed to carry them to Parliament for Parliament to ratify it? I need to move to oh. um, Honourable Samjo, but I oh, think Honourable, Honourable please <laughs> let Prof. <laughs> I prof, I'll give you a second to say whatever it is you want to say you quickly, know, and then I go to th that Mrs. person. George. Is a grieved person. Mm -hmm. He felt he has a lease, and the minister <laughs> is putting a hurdle in his way. So he has the <laughs> right mm. to go to court mm. <laughs> to see, but. The compliance aspect is the overruling right. power. Right. He didn't comply with right. the rules and regulations. Very well. Yeah. Let me go to Honorable Sam George. Yes. I think in your earlier submissions, you preempted this discussion, and I said we'll come to that. So in view of this ruling and the findings that have been stated here, do you still hold the view that government set out to, as it were, destroy <coughs> the business of Exton Cubic? I made my earlier submission on the basis that why was the government revoking the licenses and not looking to regularize or formalize the issues of the licenses. I mean, you can raise the legal requirements of Article 268, Article 2692, and all of those things, and, and bring up the minerals. And I had that conversation quietly with uh, lawyer Yao Pong, even in the course of the program. 
You can raise all of that. But I'll give you a typical example of where parliamentary ratification was needed, wasn't done originally. And this government sought to seek parliamentary ratification to regularize and put things in the right perspective. Mm-hmm. In the issue of the Gitmo. Sure, yeah. sure. You understand me? Mm-hmm. So now, let's ask ourselves a question. If this government is saying that they will not regularize the process by bringing it to parliament, because the minister at the time, under the NDC administration, failed to bring it to parliament, and they are saying that that is the reason why they can't bring it to parliament. Yeah, their own no, action, I, I'm coming, mm-hmm. their own action in the Gitmo 2 negates that position. Now, I, I and I told... No, but you see, no, the no, Gitmo no, 2 going to... Just a minute. <laughs> With the Gitmo 2, that was as a result of the Supreme Court's decision. That this is what you have to do. So it wasn't... No, no. no it was. No. The there Supreme was Court ruling was clear. You either go to parliament mm-hmm. or you send the people back. Not send the people back. Or oh, that no. after the expiration that, of that no, period. No, that was it. No, I mean, let's no. not argue the on Supreme that. The Supreme Court gave the government two options. Okay. Either you bring it, either you bring the the, the 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 agreement to Parliament for ratification, or you give them ninety days and evict them. Is and that, government that, chose to bring it to court. Wrong. Government's mm-hmm. hands were not tied mm-hmm. by the Supreme that's Court ruling wrong. to bring it for ratification. It was a decision taken by government. And I'm making that that point to establish the fact that governments can always seek <coughs> to go back to do the right thing. Now, in this issue. The reason why X in Cubic will not be given, and again, is the misinformation out there. And Honorable Obiama has put out that untruth or, 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 or misinformation out. Mm-hmm. Ibrahim Mahama is not a shareholder of X in Cubic. He does not own X in Cubic. Mm-hmm. The three owners of X in Cubic, a sister radio, uh, radio station, mm-hmm. wrote to the Registrar General, my general line, mm-hmm. they wrote to the Registrar General's department, and the three owners of X in Cubic have been put out. Ibrahim Mahama is not. It is not. <laughs> I've shown it to you. Yeah, you. No, you mentioned Ibrahim Mahama, and I'm putting on record. That Mr. Yes. Ibrahim Mahama. Well, for, yes. I yes. don't have any information to the yes. contrary yes. as it is now, mm-hmm. so well, I cannot necessarily I, I'm speak to that. But if you have, you, then that's, that's, that's fine. I can read a letter out to you. It's, it's a 29th March 2017 letter from the Registrar General's Department to Multimedia Limited Accra. And it says, RE, search on Exton Cubic Group Limited. We refer to your letter dated 28 March 2017 in relation to the above named company. And then it goes on to give incorporation date and everything. Now, these are the three directors. Kweku Pobi. Michael Mahama and owner Maxwell. <laughs> None of this is Ibrahim Mahama. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm and, sorry. And, and, and because <laughs> Brother Mahama. Which other two bro- okay. is Mr. Pobi and me, and, 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 and Mahama. Is it Ma- which match for Mahama? Do you know? Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Every Mahama in Ghana is not exactly. Exactly. You, you, have the, you have the you have a point there. I mean, really, I mean, there are a million so and one Mahamas in here. We can't necessarily conclude that. And for me, that was why I said. Those issues mm. do not take and away yes. from and, and, and the and essence no, of no. this ruling. You see, you see, so whether it's the president's my, 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 my brother or not, is a and mm-hmm. that is why, because he put out something. I'm, I'm tra- actually I'm trying, trying to. Yeah, 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 we, 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 trying we, to we, I think we yes. You no, apologize. Yes. Okay, fine. So, so, so let me let me proceed. So carry on. Let me proceed. Let me proceed. Carry on. Very well. So I'm glad. I'm glad we've cleared that issue. Now the second issue is, I have a problem with the rulings of our Supreme Court. Okay. In the take for example the Waterville the Isofoton cases, and that is exactly what is being used here again. Look, our Supreme Court, and with the greatest deference and respect for the, that apex court of the land, my my my, my 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 <laughs> position, my position which I hold, is that the rulings of our Supreme Court in those cases, the Balkan Energy and all of that, seeks to give government a carte blanche to be responsible, because it is not the responsibility of any business interest to present issues or contracts before parliament for ratification. It is the responsibility of government to go before parliament, the executive to go before the legislature to seek approval. Mm. It is not in Exting Cubic's place to come and lay that contract agreement before parliament. Neither was it in the place of Balkan Energy or any of the other predetermined cases by the Supreme Court. If our Supreme Court is going to continue to give a carte blanche to our government, that they can do what is wrong, and then come back when there's a change of government or the same government changes its mind on the issue, and come and seek refuge in the apex court and say that because the constitution was not up, up, upheld, the president and his ministers take an oath to defend the constitution and abide by mm-hmm. it. And so our Supreme Court must be seen to be holding governments, irrespective of which government it is, NDC, mm-hmm. NPP, responsible for their actions and not private business interests. And in all of this, in all of this, 
were fighting extinct cubic, saying that they don't have a right. We are taking it because they did not acquire a right properly, so called as per Article 268 and parliamentary ratification no, but did requirement. They, did they? Well, well, do you think they did? Well, did as far as I'm concerned, they have. They did everything they had to do. But somebody in government, in somebody in government failed to comply. As far as extinct cubic was was concerned, everything they had to do, they had done. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, all of this fight is for what? For us to take this same mining license and give to a Chinese company. And then we sit back and say that we want to grow Ghanaian business. Isn't, isn't, isn't that speculative? I mean, It's like, not speculative. How, how do you know that it's but going to be given our, to... Our vice president has gone to China and promised the same, the same concessions. It's not speculative. But the point is... This is not speculation. This is fact. We will that have... That we are fighting a Ghanaian Mr. business... Mr. 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 Give, Samotri, give, just a minute. To give it to just a Chinese a minute, company. Gentlemen, let's, let's look if at this. you don't have it, who is Just a minute. Please, let's, let's still... You don't have it. You let's have it. Let's have the discussion in perspective. Honorable. The court has ruled that you don't have it. Honorable, please. So who is taking it away from you? Honorable. We're, we're going, <laughs> Mr. Sam George, to your, to your issues. I yeah. think you're raising some issues there which we need to, yes, look at. But foreign investments or FDIs, yes, will continue to be a part of us. I mean, we need that, yes. But it doesn't take away the fact that we need to comply with our laws. Mm. I have not so that, yes, if there's, a new, per, if, I'm, if there's I'm, a new I'm entity the coming question. in, it's for us to ensure yeah, they that the they, they comply. comply. And I'm asking the question. And whoever fails to comply no, should face the consequences. No, no, you see, you see, we can choose. We can choose to avoid the elephants in the room. Okay. <laughs> <Could That's, you laughs> that? well, that's a dramatic <laughs> expression to avoid it, to ignore the elephants in the room. As unfortunate, honourable Obama is in the room, but I mean, <laughs> but we can choose to Carry ignore us. the Just elephants in the room. Like yeah, I know. The, the bottom strong, line here yeah. is this: mm -hmm. if we could take the Gitmo to back to parliament, agreement back to parliament for ratification. If we have a government that is committed to going Ghanaian business, FDI is fantastic, FDI is important. But look, before those companies can come in from their countries to come and work here in Ghana, it's because their home countries give them the opportunity to grow. We gave a Ghanaian company, Zoom Lion, President Kufo gave him a fantastic opportunity to build a conglomerate. Today, a Ghanaian company, Zoom Lion, is working in several African countries. He would not have had a track record to go into Angola or go into Liberia or any of those other African countries. But he African complied countries. with the rules, didn't yeah. he? Oh, oh, oh! You, you can, you can have, you can raise for many me, issues yes. over but there. For me, but that, that was the because no, thing, no, you're, you're not getting the point mm -hmm. I'm making. It was a conscious effort by government to build a Ghanaian business. Whatever business or company you're bringing from outside Ghana to come and work in Ghana, that home country has made a conscious effort mm. to build that brand. If Extinct Cubic is a Ghanaian company, Extinct Cubic has the resources and the wherewithal to execute this project. But because of a government agency, not Extinct Cubic its own failure, but a government agency's failure to do the right thing, are you going to deprive your own Ghanaian company at the expense of a foreign company? That is where I ask the question of nationalism. Mm. And that's yes. the question we should that's answer. Yes, um, quickly, Mr. Well, first of all, you, you, you did well by proving that to Honorable <laughs> was wrong, and a lot of people as well. But the issue about the Vice President going to China, you haven't been able to give this uh, concession or these minerals to a Chinese company. I think you haven't been able to prove it. And, and therefore, oh, and, 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 and you know, you know, you know, fairness. No, please, let me go on. Let me go on. Please. But, but you see, the example you gave also, that it is for the minister or a state agency to go to parliament or to ensure compliance. Yeah. It, it, though persuasive, it's not compelling. Because it's like, let me give you maybe a basic example, illustration. A thief comes to your house, mm. st steals from you, you arrest him, oh, give me my things back. Or he's taken to the police, say, ah, but you were supposed to have locked your door. Mm. Mm. If you didn't lock your door and I've come to steal from you, yeah. Why can you say so that I'm a thief? Bring, bring it back. In the contract itself, it was stated that this contract shall not come into effect yeah. until okay. and unless Parliament has ratified. Yeah. And you have put your hand, your seal, the, under the contract. And you Parliament have, doesn't do it. And, uh, and Parliament decide. hasn't done it. Well, gone on side and you say see, I have I, to I, have so I think that companies must also be very, quite cautious in entering into contract with government. Yes. And you, you make sure that until the government has complied with all the requirements and until you have done yours, don't start investing under such a contract because it doesn't exist. I, 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 I get that argument, but quickly, isn't there the presumption of regularity that whoever is coming in is expecting that 
you would have done everything else. So I shouldn't okay. necessarily. Well, you know, yeah. I'm just, I'm just okay. putting that out there. Presumptions are subject yes. to law. Yes. That is why are rebuttable mm -hmm. by law. Mm -hmm. You know that there is, or oh, it's a law, so you are, you have to know or consult Abna or your phone <laughs> so we get something to talk <laughs> Lawyer, <laughs> what is it thing. that I have to do yes. mm -hmm. to ensure that I enter into a valid contract mm -hmm. with the government of Ghana? Mm -hmm. It is your duty to seek that legal advice. Indeed, indeed. Some companies, they insist that this agreement comes into effect after parliamentary ratification. Oh, yeah, in this contract, in this lease, it's it's in, the, in so it. the company so itself knows that until this minister sends this thing to parliament, it does not come into force. I'm not going to put the best one in. But, but let me say some, yes, something a motion. bit collateral. As, I think he said something interesting. You see, these matters come up. It is about governance. They come up after a government has exited. And it is so dangerous. From Faro Atlantic, Balkan Energy to Wyoming to the present. We spoke about continuity. Minerals Commission, Lands Commission. These institutions are represented by other institutions, representatives of other institutions. Why do they sit by yeah. for laws to be violated yeah. and they, these same representatives or others from these same yeah. in other institutions representing, including the Bar Association? You sit by for these things to go wrong yeah. and then the, there is a new government, the same person or somebody from that institution goes to represent and they say that we did, we did wrong. And nobody holds them accountable. So we should not just be holding the minister and the company responsible. Without All those, especially in the Minerals Commission, mm. because they choose competent people or people who have held themselves out as competent to represent these various institutions. I need, to take, some, I need to take some messages. The I person think, who I think, even I think, the no, 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 Mr. Mr. Sanko, no, just, proof of the Baumiakwe. Just a minute. Let no, me read some no, messages. Please, please yeah, allow me. Quickly. Proof of the that, just a minute. The fact that you're a Ghanaian You're company, you want to operate in Ghana. That doesn't mean you should flout the laws. Very well. If you I, go I, to I, US, I, no US uh, company will be allowed to flout the laws just because it's very well, an indigenous Obi. company. Very well, Mr. Obiamo. I need to take some messages. Mr. Sam George, I'll tell you when you can come in, please. <laughs> Let's just you. exercise restraints. <laughs> I hear you. Mosa Abatua and Kumasa says, Abna, I have never in my life witnessed such uh, it says, hollow and empty state of the nation address in the history of Fourth Republic. Mm -hmm. Economic growth is increasing, yet Ghanaians are suffering. What kind of economy? Is this Accra Digital Center is an excellent edifice in um, by former President Mahama, but he failed to acknowledge that clearly it was a state of promises. Uh, this one coming in from Nana Mensa in Kwame says, if the minority says it is some of their policies that is yielding results now, then they should as well admit that it is these same policies that has brought the untold hardship they, they mm. claim on Ghanaians. Um, it is refreshing to bring in professionals to educate us like Professor Dodunu instead of <laughs> politicians who only come to do propaganda and <laughs> miseducate us. Oh, please. They are just, they're good politicians around, please. Good morning. It says, um, there's nothing implicit about the high court ruling. The aspect to do with the Minister of Lands and Natural Resources was a low point. Unfortunately, that's what the media is rather focusing on. The high court explicitly did what the lands minister did not have power to do. Uh, and that's bathing from Oda. Um, good morning, Abna. Please tell some George where in this country where people buy fertilizer, 100 Ghana cities. He says, we the Northerners are feeling and enjoying a not free education. Mm -hmm. One NDC mm -hmm. should know is that yes, Mahama was good. I, I, I don't quite get this message, unfortunately. I have to skip it. Good morning, Abna and your panelists. President Ekufado must be called to order for, he says, what for entering for... I'm not getting this, uh, but entering fear into matters concerning corruption. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> that's the same thing. I, I, your message, I'm sorry, but it's not clear. Um, now, all the commodities um, George put out there are, he says, you're saying lies, just say they are untruth. If not, ask him. <laughs> if he <laughs> says yeah. rice, he should tell us what yeah. brand and type because they are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are a variety of rice out there. That's Cape we're doing our page. Thank you. And hi, Madam Abna and panelists. For me, NPP and NDC are trading the same goods because they both talk as if they can come and transform the fortunes of our country overnight. But when they finally come, 
they realize the kitchen is not as easy as they see it while in opposition, then you will see them talking plenty. For me, they set <laughs> an <laughs> unachievable target while in opposition. Therefore, <laughs> both NPP and NDC are the same. They talk plenty and do very little. Um, this is Emmanuel from Asham, and please let Sam George give us the figures of 2015 to 2016 when then we compare to 2017 to 2018 to make his um, he says voodoo analysis <laughs> he's making. I mean, what voodoo analysis, seriously? Well, I will, I will, I think I'll, I can end the messages here and then we need to take a break. I'm told we'll take a break when we come back. Indeed, we're running out of time. We just move quickly. I'll take Sam George's um, last comment and then we move on to look at else? the president's um, <laughs> scheduled appraisal with his appointees. What are we to make of that? What is to come out of that? on Monday when he meets one-on-one -on -one with his appointees. So watch a new day, Saturday edition. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to New Day Saturday edition and we're just about wrapping up on the show. We, prior to the break, we were looking at um, the Exton um, Cubic case and the ruling that came from the court this week. We've been analyzing it uh, quite in, in some detail. But we'll be moving on to look at the um, imminent assessment by the president of some appoint or his appointees following some um, evaluation report that was submitted to him by the Minister for Monitoring and Evaluation. So we will carry on with that. We just have about 15 minutes to wrap up on the show so we don't have much time. We'll just do a quick round. I'll start with um, uh, Honorable Sam George here. The Minister of Monitoring and Evaluation, MNE, was one of the six creations, the new creations of the um, president. And I think it was one of those, indeed, it was received with some, if you like, resistance or criticism that, I mean, this is just a superfluous ministry or, you know, we could have done MNE under the existing um, sector ministries. Why this special? vehicle if you like and now we are hearing this is coming out is is the ministry of monitoring evaluation now becoming relevant in the scheme of things do well, you think well uh with the greatest amount of respect to you i just want to because my oh no i, I challenged yes, on something sure, let me sure, just sure. put out um, I, that yeah. escaped me you can i was ahead. asked to substantiate the claim i made that dr baumia mm -hmm. had offered to the chinese from my join online the 4th of July 2017, there's a story with a headline, Baumia outlines 20 projects from China's $15 billion. Now, let me just read the paragraph that is relevant. A major part of our conversation in China was the integrated aluminum industry development. This involves development of the Nihini and Chebi bauxite mines in an aluminum refinery. Nihini Reserve is one of the extinct mm -hmm. cubic reserves. So that's why, and that's a proof of my claim that the office of the vice president had offered this to China and all of this Chinese involvement. So this is your, this is the proof. <laughs> but anyways, I mean, it, would, it would, it would, it would still be subject to parliamentary <laughs> ratification. Is, this is but that's this, this is Vice President Bao Mian. That's How can this be an offer? That, you, that's you choose not to see it as an offer. That's fine. He says that he's offered it to them. Okay, you carry it. In return for $15 but now, this is the thing mentioned in the Hini. Yeah. 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 Clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. Clock is ticking. But please yeah, let yeah, please yeah, allow yeah. please allow yeah. Honorable. Yeah. Please yeah. allow yeah. Sam George to make his um <laughs> submissions and then we go on. Please carry on. No, no, he, he's no, going he's on. A new one. Please allow him. Carry on, please. Can I carry on? Carry on, please. Thank you. Honorable Honorable Obiam is pretty excited this morning. But you see, uh the issue of the M and E ministry for me still remains extremely superfluous. Okay. Um and this whole exercise that we're told is going to happen on Monday, where you're going to have um, ministers being what appraised, yes, is is much ado about nothing. The president has already, like he always does, preempted whatever he's going to be doing. By and, and I cracked a joke with Honorable Alan Chamanting and Honorable Isaac Esiama in Parliament on Thursday, where I said to them that they should be mindful they may be out in a reshuffle and they asked me why i said because the president listed ministers he kept mentioning the ministers and giving them credit he didn't mention honorable elijah Mantin's name or isaac kesiyama's name so if you are a minister your name wasn't mentioned in the state of the nation's <laughs> address just the president is not happy with you and so that appraisal has already been done i mean like i said the state of promises <laughs> that's a rebuttable presumption <laughs> <laughs> the state of promises address uh -huh. was a shout out to ministers mm. uh, honorable obi amwa's minister was mentioned so she's safe um <laughs> He didn't go into deputy minister, so I can't pass judgment on Honorable Obi Amwa yet. But I mean, you don't, you, you don't, you don't expect. I'm enamored by you. Don't worry. 
<laughs> you don't you don't expect much ado about anything. Take for example, um, the president referred to his agri minister as a champion of Ghanaian farmers. Talk to Ghanaian farmers and they'll tell you that this minister failed them, especially those of them who are into maize cultivation with the army worm thing. So clearly, the president's judgment of what the Ghanaian people think of his ministers is flawed. Um, if you look at the public perception on the, the impropriety of the actions of the minister for finance in the 2.25 billion bond and what the, the, the court of public opinion thinks, and the president referring to him as a national asset, again, you see the disconnect between the president the court of public the opinion. <laughs> And then you've been to Shiraz, so <laughs> and, and, if, you, and if, you, if you even read the Shiraz report, the Shiraz report is damning oh. in, in, in what its findings are. Mm -hmm. What you can what the government seeks to find refuge in in the Shiraz report is the recommendations, but they don't they are not talking, they're silent on the findings. Mm -hmm. The findings are very damning for the integrity of the, the finance well. minister. One well, last example I'll give, one last example I'll give to wrap up. The minister speaks about his fisheries minister's hard working, yet, fishery and fisheries, if you take the 2018 budget. The fishery sector declined by 17 percent, negative 17 percent. Yet he says that she's, she's, she's a hardworking minister. Under her watch, her own brother was responsible for the diversion of premix. Yet the, minister, the president finds her as hardworking. So I don't expect the president to come and give us uh, a credible valuation of Very his ministers. Well. He's going to come and do a cover up like he's done in the Bost, okay. in the Thank Shraj, you. and other cases. Honorable Sam George, we move on to um, Lawyer Paul <laughs> quickly to wrap up. I, my yeah. concern mm -hmm. is that. First of all, we should know the job description, what the ministers are supposed to do. When you read the Constitution, mm -hmm. Article 78, all that it says under Clause 2 is that the president shall appoint such members of ministers of state as may be necessary for the efficient running of the state. That, to my mind, is the main function of ministers of state. And you say such numbers. So, I mean, as many as the president thinks, shall enable him uh, um, manage the economy mm. in efficient way, that is fine. So I would have thought that then before the evaluation, we should have known their job description, the estimated- And then the key performance yes, indicators yes, and everything. Yes, the performance really indicators, what their targets are. And we will also pray that, because President Mahama did it, which was good, but we never, or at least I never got to know of the results in terms of each minister after the assessment. Mm -hmm. I understand some red pen were used, others uh, green pen. But we never got to know. And we didn't see immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think the president used green pen usually, but yeah, when right. red is used, it means. Yeah, drove, but <laughs> I would have expected that. Then after that, minister after minister, we should be told whether they have been able to meet the criteria or their job description, mm. or even the targets given them. It would not be enough, with all due respect, to do this exercise and just keep it under wraps or conceal it. We should know how our ministers are performing. Especially of when it's publicized, that is going yes. to happen. We, we and are you see, some of them, they are always in the public mm. view. But there are others doing like, um, the, the evaluation mm. minister. Mm. But for this, most people would have thought that, of course, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ada, Hasn't been yes, uh, a sanitation was so, not also mentioned, but so he was well. mentioned. I think we need to. Oh, the president it? actually commented that's fine. The, the sanitation, we oh, have oh. he commented six minutes. Please let me allow the other two. I wanted you to come out. Let me allow the other two to finish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dodono, quickly on this the president during the media press, I mean, was asked the question about the number whether it was going to be reduced or not, and clearly he stated that he was fine with what was happening. So, question then is, I mean. Wasn't that preemptive of this exercise then? Because clearly we get the sense that nothing will change. Well, I, I, I don't think so. I have a contrary view. Okay. First and foremost, again from the pure policy practitioner's mm -hmm. point of view, the president has done nothing wrong. The fundamental law of the country has not been violated. Second, you know, if we talk seriously about public policy in Ghana, the weakness, the 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 the, the, the bane is monitoring and evaluation. That's right. And if you see some of our companies that are fairly performing 
and some are really performing well, they have their own internal performance assessment. Mm. Yes. They are always trying. The staffs are assessed. I, I still work with some banks and they do that. Mm. When it is national, we vet our people. They are to be monitored mm. and so on. We envelope their forms and we never see them. We never hear statements about our people. So I if I hear that they are very serious on MNE. Indeed, MNE is one of the critical stages. If you use the four generic stage, policy mm -hmm. formulation, planning, implementation, monitoring, monitoring and evaluation. Yeah. These four generic. Mm. MNE is very weak. Go to all the ministries. You see, we have policy analysis divisions. We have statistics divisions. We have many of them. They f we have formulation. We have development planning, and we have Ministry of Finance and economic planning. They do budget. Therefore, they are also economic planners. If you talk about the budgeting, we have the, their offices well equipped. Go to the monetary mm -hmm. and evaluation. You see some old computer. <laughs> It's more like an afterthought. Which came before Christ came <laughs> into this world. <laughs> on that note, Prof, I think yes. I need to move on because we've <laughs> literally run out of time. <laughs> so, yes, Mr. Um, Obi yes, Thank you. Um, I've listened to Dr. Antonia Kotose. Mm. He's made it clear that what he's doing has uh, no implication on the meeting that the president wants to have with his ministers. Mm. Indeed, um, f from Friday, the president will be meeting deputy ministers and ministers at Pediasi. It's a three-day retreat at Pediasi to look back at what we'll be able to achieve in 2017, how we pursue what our goals in 2018. And it's normal for president to be meeting his ministers and to be discussing various issues, challenges, etc. It is not the case. That indeed he's going to assess them and decide after oh, the well meeting. That's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. And after the meeting, he's going to throw somebody out it or he's going to retain yes. some. Oh. We should be careful in connecting it. Mm. And but indeed, MAE is doing a very fantastic mm -hmm. job. Because but why the, why the disconnect? Why shouldn't it be connected? No, obviously, if MAE submits its report, the report will not just be that this ministry has not performed, this ministry has performed. The reasons will be assigned. Why? These targets could not be achieved mm. at this point. The reasons why these targets, and it could not necessarily be that it's because of the performance of the minister. We have to get it very clear. Mm. And they, just last Friday, we met a team from MAE, and we're meeting them again on Monday they, they, as to how to 2018 we're going to achieve what we've set out ourselves to achieve, the outcomes and the indicators and everything. So it's a very useful ministry, and they are doing very well. They should let us know. They, mm. they, at the end of the day, even if the appointment, let, uh, the appointment letters given to ministers, mm. sometimes it spells out what you're going to do in the ministry. It's not just that you're going very to assist well. the minister. Thank you so very much. Let's, let's not put that into that uh, frame. Well, that that our time is up. But <laughs> before we go, I need you to comment on this. This is coming in uh, that an employee of Avians who worked on the cargo that contained the armored cars procured for the presidency has been arrested and detained by the BNI since Tuesday for allegedly taking and sharing the photos on social media. Now, the, his family is demanding answers in respect of the fact that um, uh, he, he yes, he make, it's, it's been his yeah. arrest and government silence on the issue. It's so, court, but I found it a bit uh, strange that these security uh, things, even before they were checking out, pictures were all over the place. Mm. If it's the person no, in charge is, is, is made up, if the person in me. charge has uh, infringed on anything, the law should take his course. Mm. Mm. So you if they complain that, that yeah. abuse mm -hmm. the person's right, if exactly they, because there's a there's a constitutional, constitutional the, provision. The 48 hours have elapsed. Yes, we will end yes. up now going to, go to, court, to pay yeah. compensation mm. for wrongful detention and all of that. But right. you see, the easy okay. government people say go to court, go to court. Very mm. well. I mean, we would have to wrap up <laughs> at this point. We've done. <laughs> All our time for today's <laughs> discussions. Thank you so much, my panelists, um, Mr. Obi Amoa, Professor Kletus Dodonu, Mr. Yao Pong, Mr. Sam George. And thank you so much for spending your Saturday mornings with us. We've been, um, thank you for sending through your 
contributions, your remarks, and all of that. We do appreciate that. We'll see you here same time next week. Until then, have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>